ever wondered who's in charge of Nirvana's legacy after Kurt Cobain's tragic passing? You know, but when people come to me and say, I love Nirvana, I wasn't in Nirvana. However, I do own Nirvana with my daughter. Kurt's passing without a will created significant turmoil, casting his estate into a state of chaos. Courtney was given 98% of Nirvana's publishing rights, with the remaining 2% split between Gruel and Novo Selic. However, it did not go smoothly. Dave makes $5 million a show. He doesn't need the money. His, father's a, his mother's a banker, his father's a stockbroker, and um, he's making $5 million a show. He's making things in the food fight, he's making a fortune. Why the f then does, does he have a Nirvana Inc. credit card and I don't, and last week he bought an Aston Martin on it. Intense disputes arose between the band and the wife, resulting in her selling significant portions to new parties, which led to losses in the millions. But before we start, if you're new here, hit subscribe and push the like button to help us beat the algorithm. Now, let's get started. Let's go back to 1994, a year marked by tragedy for all of us. Kurt Cobain was found dead at his home in Seattle. But what happened to the band after this heartbreaking event? Well, three years later, Nirvana had to transform. It became a business named Nirvana LLC. This change meant that instead of just making music, Nirvana now had to manage things like their final tracks, merchandise, and even Kurt Cobain's image. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic and Courtney Love all got a share of this new business. Unfortunately, Kurt never went forward with this estate plan. So when he died, his estate passed to Courtney and their daughter, Frances Bean. We'll get back to that in a bit later. By now, we all know that Kurt wrote most of the songs, which makes his part very valuable. But owning a piece of Nirvana LLC meant they could make big decisions about Nirvana's music and how it's used in ads or movies. However, it wasn't all smooth sailing. Courtney had different ideas from Dave and Chris, and she didn't always agree with how they wanted to use Nirvana's music and tried to take full control of the catalog. But her efforts were often shut down by the company's rules and lawyers. By 2001, Nirvana became a battleground. Courtney filed a lawsuit against Dave and Chris. She didn't agree with how the business was being run and felt that her ideas were always voted down the trouble began over the song called, You Know, You're Right, recorded just before Kurt's death. Courtney saw it as a massive hit in the making, but Dave and Chris had plans to include it in a Nirvana box set, something she opposed fiercely. In response, she took legal action suing Dave and Chris for control of the band's legacy. She won a preliminary injunction, stopping the song's release. Her argument was she held exclusive rights to all unpublished songs of Kurt Cobain. She didn't approve Nirvana's last song for the box set celebrating Nevermind's 10th anniversary because she saw it as exploiting Kurt's work. Dave and Chris fought back. They accused her of using the song to leverage her position in an ongoing battle with Universal Music Group. This company absorbed DGC Records, Nirvana's original label. Dave and Chris claimed she was stalling the box set's release for personal gain. The lawsuit was complex and Courtney wanted to dissolve Nirvana LLC. In other words, she wanted to end this business arrangement with Dave and Chris. This business required complete agreement decisions on major issues, leading to constant deadlocks. Courtney argued she was under the impression she could be forced out of her husband publishing rights if she didn't join the partnership. She also downplayed Dave and Chris' contributions to Nirvana, claiming the band was solely Kurt's creation. Because Dave knows that I know, that he knows, that I know, that he knows, that I know, all right? So he didn't write one note. He didn't even write the drum riff and Smells Like Teen Spirit. Kurt owns 100% of that publishing. On the other side, Dave and Chris saw Courtney as an outsider trying to control and exploit Nirvana's legacy for her own benefit. They even tried to remove her from the company. Chris went as far as to say she was a complete alien to Nirvana's music and success. 
In 2011, Courtney criticized the use of Nirvana's song Smells Like Teen Spirit in the movie featuring the Muppets. What are you doing? With the so lights accusing Disney of not having the rights to use the song, stating that it disrespected the memory of her late husband. She claimed she had absolute control over Cobain's catalog. However, this claim is questionable since she sold a portion of her rights to Primary Wave Music Publishing. There are conflicting reports about the exact percentage sold. Some reports state she sold between 25% and 50% of her rights. The deal was valued at $19.5 million. It's important to note that before this sale, Courtney was given 98% of Nirvana's publishing rights following Cobain's death, with the remaining 2% split between Grohl and Novoselic. This transaction was a significant financial move to Larry Mestel of Primary Wave Music Publishing. He reportedly paid more than 50 millions for these rights. To start Primary Wave, we knew that the best way to get credibility and respectability was to buy something that was credible and respectable. You know, there isn't much more credibility in music than Nirvana and specifically Kurt Cobain, who wrote almost all the songs. Courtney Love was in a position where she wanted to sell a chunk of his catalog. Uh, we were, and we were in the right place at the right time and knew the right people. Courtney tried to justify this move by how overwhelming it is to manage the estate and her need for a strategic partner to bring Kurt's songs to the next generation. As of now, the ownership of Nirvana's rights and public image is divided among several parties, and no one has full control over the band's legacy. Let's take a look at the current status. We've got Frances Bean Cobain. Her father, Kurt, died without a will, and the distribution of his estate was decided by the courts, naming her mom, Courtney, as the executor of his estate. Over the years, Courtney lost a substantial amount of the money generated by Nirvana, estimated to be around $27 million. In 2010, Frances Bean Cobain inherited 37% of her father's estate and gained control of the publicity rights to Kurt Cobain's name and image, which were previously under Courtney Love's control. The value of this inheritance increased over time. By 2014, the entire estate was estimated to be worth around $450 million. Then we have Primary Wave, a major player in music publishing, holds around 25 to 50 percent of Nirvana's rights, representing the business side of music. And we also have Universal Music Group having absorbed DGC Records. They plays a crucial role in the band's music distribution. Meanwhile, Nirvana LLC, which includes Dave and Chris, continues to have a say in the management and licensing of Nirvana's music and merchandise. They currently earn royalties from Nirvana's music. Specifically, they each receive 12.5% of royalties from 11 Nirvana songs. And there you have it the ongoing story of who controls Nirvana's rights and public image. From court battles to multi-million dollar deals, the path has been anything but simple. Now we want to hear from you. What's your take on this complex web of ownership? Do you think Kurt Cobain would have approved of how things turned out? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And remember, this isn't the first time we've seen such a tangle when the front man dies. We've also covered Soundgarden and their legal disputes. So make sure to watch that video too. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.